Okay, hi there and welcome to another in our series of special videos looking at aspects of the economics of pandemics and the economic crisis. In this session, we'll think about some of the externalities of highly infectious transmitted diseases. Here's a quote from a paper published in the late spring of 2013 from Oleg Jonas. Uh, reducing pandemic risk is a low priority in the health sector. Well, clearly no longer, which moreover cannot address the externalities involved. Externalities are everywhere. And of course, what a pandemic does, uh, it accentuates, it amplifies the, the nature and the cost and the scale of those, of those externalities. Here's a slightly longer quote uh, from the paper. I'll, I'll put a link to the paper in the comments section of the video. Uh, at the moment, the, the natural working assumption is that a pandemic has a, uh, has a sort of 1% chance in any one year and that uh, the death rate is averages about 1% of the population. Well, we're finding information, data every day about, about whether this is true. Uh, clearly, uh, what we're going to focus on is the impact of the pandemic on the, in terms of externalities, both negative and positive. Strongly recommend, by the way, that you follow the tweets of John Byrne Murdoch, uh, the FT. They've now made this data freely available on the FT website, which tracks, of course, both the number of confirmed cases and sadly, the cumulative number of deaths by, by country um, since the 10th death. And you can see where countries are day by day in terms of tracking the, the impact of the pandemic. Of course, the number of deaths on the y-axis there is on a logarithmic scale. Here's a question. Indeed, you may want to pause the video at certain points if you want to have a think about uh, the answer. So what is a pandemic? Well, a pandemic is defined by the World Health Organization as a disease epidemic that has spread across a large region, for example, across continents or indeed worldwide. And we are now dealing with a global pandemic. My next question is, what is an externality? Again, press the pause button on the video if you want to think about the answer to that question. What is an externality? Well, an externality refers to a cost or benefit, a spillover incurred or received by a third Party. In other words, an economic decision made by one person can affect somebody else who's not specified uh, outside the transaction. And often the third party has no control over the creation of that cost or benefit. An externality can be both positive, generating external benefits, social benefits, uh, or it can be negative, generating external costs and social costs. And of course, it can stem from production and or consumption of a good or service. The wide interpretation about externalities, broadening out the definition of an externality, focuses on the, just the wider spillovers outside any market transaction or event. But what I want to make to you in this session is I think we need to think more widely about externalities in terms of that narrow textbook definition. Externalities flow from the choices, the decisions that people and businesses make within civil society and within markets. Policy interventions such as epidemic, pandemic mitigation also create externalities and can also lead to unintended consequences. I think the point I'm trying to make here is that we need to broaden out our concept of externalities. And oftentimes it's not necessarily buying a good or service uh, in a transaction. The externalities are pervasive within the whole of civic society and that needs to be thought about in this context. Here's a chance to pause the video again if you're using this as a lesson. Can you identify some negative externalities, some additional social costs from the spread or the impact of a pandemic? Press the pause button and uh, think about some of your answers. Well, lots of potential negative externalities. Let me pick out a few. There's obviously the macroeconomic fallout from lost jobs, lost incomes. The government, uh, in many cases, having to face a, a higher tax burden uh, as government debt goes up. There's an intergenerational equity issue here that the consequences of this pandemic will be felt not just by the current generation, but by succeeding generations in terms of, for example, tax burdens and national debt. The risk uh, is that macroeconomic depression can also lead to significant permanent long term effects. So the, the economists call this hysteresis, where a severe downturn in the economy actually can reduce the productive capacity of a country, people become inactive, good businesses go to the wall, and that can if you like, permanently damage per capita incomes beyond where they would have been. And the Greek depression after the financial crisis is probably a good example of that. 
Another negative externality refers from our social behaviours. So, for example, the social behaviour we've seen in the recent days of people going to parks and trying to climb Snowden and not, not, not adhering to social distancing, physical distancing. Those social behaviours that spread infection, while well, they often have a very low private cost and a high private benefit, a walk in the park or going for a run or something, but obviously potentially a high social cost. Many of these behaviours, of course, stem from ignorance. Panic buying in supermarkets is probably a good example of a negative externality. People panic buying toilet rolls and pasta and health products reduces the supply for others. Those food supplies are rival and in particular they may well reduce the available supply for, for key workers coming towards the end of a shift. And then I think we can broaden out our definition of externalities. Uh, what are potentially the consequences of a pandemic in terms of the threats to social capital and the social contracts between people and government. Will, will a pandemic, does it, does it risk social breakdown in a negative externality sense, a loss of trust uh, and, um, and fear uh, and uh, uh, impact on, for example, mental health aspects? Or does, does a pandemic actually enhance social capital by bringing people, uh, paradoxically, they can't, uh, they're socially distanced, but they find creative ways of coming, coming back together? Some economists argue that inequality is, a, is an externality. So what's, what's the impact of the pandemic on inequality of income and wealth, both at a local, national and supranational level? And crucially, if we think there are negative externalities from pandemics, which I think we can probably claim there are, how do we put a value on human suffering? How do we put a value on the mental health impacts? These things don't have market prices. How do we put a, a value on the social costs of state-imposed mitigation policies? Social behaviours that spread infection, good example here from Tim Marshall. Strongly recommend you follow Tim on social media. Tim's the author of Prisoners of Geography and The Power of Flags, amongst other books. Uh, that for those people not socially distancing today, he took a breath and thousands of virus particles settled onto the lining of his mouth and throat. What about panic buying? Well, panic buying in supermarkets has consequences. Uh, clearly, the immediate consequence is empty shelves, but there are other feedback effects in terms of uh, the health and well-being of people who are working in essential public services. Uh, an interesting question is, is panic buying irrational? Might be worth looking at the work of Seth Godden in terms of understanding tribal behaviour. Economist ING Economics on their Twitter feed argue that panic buying is not irrational. It's a function of how decisions are made in groups, in tribes, in herds. And simply supplying more toilet paper may not actually solve the panic. Ant theory is really quite interesting explaining herd behaviour. Uh, Professor Simon Hicks from the London School of Economics argued that panic food shopping is a classic common pool resource collective action problem. In other words, what's best, uh, in other words, your individual response is what's best compare, uh, in, in, in connection with what other people are deciding. If somebody else is panic buying, it's individually rationally best for me to do the same. And of course, if one person does that and others do it, that leads to a collectively suboptimal equilibrium, in which case some form of enforcement or rationing may be the only solution. Have a think uh, about panic buying. Have a think about rational behaviour. Consider whether or not you can apply some lessons from game theory to what's been happening in the supermarkets. Many interventions, of course, many behaviours uh, can have significant positive externalities. So can you identify some positive external benefits from the spread and impact of a pandemic? Again, pr press the pause button if you want to take a moment or two to think about this question. So what are the positive externalities? Well, uh, consider one or two examples. If people choose to socially distance, which we're being encouraged and urged to do, that has a private cost, particularly uh, people that you're close to, but has an external benefit in the sense you're reducing the spread the risk of the spread of the virus. Self-quarantine, self-isolation has a high private cost, particularly for people who are you know, extroverts and people who are open and, uh, and uh, like to meet people and get involved. Uh, but it also has an external benefit. Having a virus testing system imposed has a private cost, both financial cost and, and, and inconvenience, but again, external benefits. So here are three examples, social distancing, self-quarantine, virus testing which have private costs but external benefits particularly if enough people adhere to existing social norms and uh, requirements.
Many people are already seeing uh, that the economic stop is reducing pollution, lower CO2 emissions, NO2 emissions, cleaner oceans. Perhaps the pandemic could be the catalyst for much greater increased community engagement at a local level, helping each other through through the difficult weeks and months ahead. We're seeing good examples of businesses responding in a very positive, socially responsible way to the challenges they face. There are some social benefits of herd immunity. Uh, enough people immune to, to effectively reduce the, the risk of catching the disease. But again, the, politi the politics of this is difficult. What is, the, what is the human cost of allowing or encouraging, in some sense, herd immunity to, to materialise? Can the healthcare systems cope with that approach? South Korea is a really good example of a country which chose a different pathway to many others. They went for early and large scale test and trace, um, including the use of mobile telephony and, and in this case, a mobile phone booth that can test people for CD, uh, COVID-19 in just seven minutes. There are private costs in doing this, but external benefits. And the strategy of massive testing has been a cornerstone in South Korea's response. They're now seeing uh, the impact on the daily new confirmed cases flattening the curve in South Korea. Singapore has also waged war on coronavirus. Timely preparation, aggressive testing, maybe a trace of a bit of luck as well. Uh, but again, uh, the, can we learn lessons from the impact of, of mitigation policies introduced in those countries, Taiwan, Singapore um, and uh, South Korea, positive externalities from these kind of policies. The economic stop has cut pollution. This is an interesting chart showing uh, NO2 emissions in eastern China, um, January 19th, uh, then the shutdown, and then basically NO2 emissions declining very sharply through February. Just a few signs, if you look bottom right here, just a few signs that uh, NO2 emissions are starting to go up as production increases again. And Venice hasn't seen clear canal water in a very long time. Dolphins appearing in Venice. Nature has just hit the reset Button. Some industries, of course, have suffered and are suffered, suffering grievously from the crisis, from the, the short term, hopefully short term depression. The cruise industries, hotels, airlines, tourism, shops and restaurants, supply chain businesses, businesses that don't have an online presence, for example, may well struggle uh, greatly. Oil producers, as the price of oil collapses below $20 a barrel. Other industries, other sectors have actually gained and benefited from. Businesses producing healthcare products, including sanitizers and masks, those producing household cleaning products, sellers of sports equipment, um, from treadmills to uh, watt bikes. The supermarket's clearly a massive role to play and they've taken on thousands of workers. Uh, the, the pandemic is clearly increasing demand for uh, logistics and delivery companies, putting extra pressure on telecoms and Wi-Fi businesses. More people downloading apps from Zoom to Teams, to the cycling app Zwift, to Peloton. And who knows, renewable energy companies may also benefit going forward as people think about uh, the, kind of, the kind of energy that they want to generate in a post-pandemic world. My final slide asks you to think about where we may be heading. We're thinking at the moment probably too much about systems and resilience in rich countries and the externalities of the pandemic in the UK and in Italy and terrible events happening in Italy and Spain. United States and so on. But please do consider how vast, unmeasurable will be the social and human costs when the coronavirus takes hold and spreads in, in lower middle income countries where, um, where fragile health systems and capacity and capability combined with weak governance may well be uh, the catalyst for something truly, truly awful in the months ahead. So there we go. This session has looked at some of the externalities of pandemics. So what I've tried to argue is that I think we need to we need to broaden and widen our consumption of externalities. Externalities don't necessarily emanate purely from a market transaction. In particular, externalities are pervasive, arising from the social behaviours and the social choices that we make within civic society. Thanks for joining in on this one. Hopefully, you found this useful. This is part of a series of videos trying to make sense of the micro and macroeconomics of the pandemic. Thank you.